Hey y'all. Uh, so it cut off on me while I was finishing up my makeup, but that's okay because right now, honestly, I'm also, um, I'm just really ready to go ahead and get on with this um, Bible study. And it's not really a Bible study, actually. This is just a devotional and it's going to be a reading. I will show you the book um, so that if you would like to get it, you can. It's called Unshakable Hope by Max Lucado. Um, and it talks about building our lives on the promises of God. And I really love him. He's my favorite Christian author. Um, he speaks in a very emotional way when he writes. And um, it works. <laughs> it appeals to me. And, um, and I like it. So I don't know if y'all are going to be comfortable with me just straight reading. So if you aren't, comment below and say I don't really like this style of... Um, Bible devotions, but it's just something different for one thing, and uh, you know, I don't want to always be the exact same way every single time. Um, I also want to give full credit because you know, I don't want to do anything here that is um, not honoring of Mr. Lucado, that these are his thoughts and his words. However, I will probably slip in a few of my own, y'all know me. So I just pray now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you'll touch our hearts with this beautiful story he's written. I like you have with other um, book pieces, inserts that I have shared and that these people will be encouraged um, by you in Jesus name. Amen. These people. That's y'all. <laughs> okay. So um, this, um, for those of you who are interested, um, Max Lucado was once, um, I think it's even on the insert of this book, hold on, was once said by Billy Graham to be one of the greatest preachers of all time. Oh, here it is. It says, this is from Billy Graham on the insert. It says, I consider Max Lucado one of the greatest preachers and wordsmiths of our generation. Billy Graham. Um, and I, oh God, y'all, this is just making me cry today, so I just wanted to share. But it's a good kind of thing, so don't be worried. Um, sometimes when we get emotional, it's because something hits us and it's good, okay? Um, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, the insert says, what is shaking your world? Um, and I would say to that, just because, you know, we comment with each other back and forth, um, that y'all have things that are shaking your world. Illness, depression, caregiving. Um, but I want you to be encouraged. And um, I want you to have some unshakable hope. And that doesn't come from Max Lucado. He's just an author. That comes from God. And uh, But I really like the way that Max brings across the points um, of faith like he does. And he is an incredible preacher of the Word of God. Um, and because the Word of God is unshakable then our hope in God is unshakable. So I hope this encourages you today. I'm going to be reading from chapter 7. And it's focusing on the scripture, Hebrews 4.15. And there's some other um, scriptures, and I will just read them as it goes. This will probably take a lot of time. So I'm just going to get into reading. Um, and I'm probably not going to skip a single thing. So this is an actual ex excerpt from his book. It will probably take many parts. And I hope that you find it encouraging. Um, chapter 7. God's promise. Hebrews 4.15. This is in the New Contemporary Version translation. Our priest is able to understand our weaknesses. Isn't that good news today? On a splendid April afternoon in 2008, two college women, softball teams, one from Oregon, one from Washington, squared off beneath the blue sky of the Cascade Mountains. Inside a chain link fence before hundreds of fans, the two teams played a decisive game. The winner would advance to the division playoffs and the loser would hang up the gloves to go home. The, winner, the Western Oregon Wolves were a sturdy team that boasted several strong batters, but Sarah Tukulski was not one of them. She hit a point one five three and played the game only because the first string right fielder had muffed a play earlier in the day. Sarah had never hit a home run, but on that Saturday, with two runners on base, she connected with a curveball and sent it sailing over the left field fence. In her excitement, Sarah missed first base. Her coach shouted for her to return and touch it. 
When she turned and started back, something popped in her knee and she went down. She dragged herself back to the bag, pulled her knee to her chest in pain and asked the first base coach, what do I do? The umpire wasn't sure. He knew if any of Sarah's teammates assisted her, she would be out. Sarah knew if she tried to stand, she would collapse. Her team couldn't help her. Her leg couldn't support her. How could she cross the home plate? The umpires huddled to talk. And while they huddled and Sarah's groan, Sarah groaned, may I make a comparison? Blame it on the preacher and me, but I see an illustration in this moment. You and I have a lot in common with Sarah Toskalski. We too have stumbled, not in baseball, but in life, in morality, honesty, integrity. We've done our best only to trip and fall. Our finest efforts have left us flat on our backs. Like Sarah, we are weakened, not with torn ligaments, but with broken hearts, weary spirits, and fading vision. The distance between where we are and where we want to be is impassable. What do we do? Where do we turn? I suggest we turn to one of the sweetest promises, Hebrews 14, 15, and 16. For our high priest, Jesus, is able to understand our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. Let us then feel very sure that we can come to God's throne where there is grace. There we can receive mercy and grace to help us when we need it. We have a high priest who's able to understand since he understands we find mercy and grace when we need it. We're not left to languish. When we fall, we're not forgotten. When we stumble, we aren't abandoned. Our God gets us. Theology textbooks discuss the promise under the healing heading incarnation. The stunning idea is simply this. God, for a time, became one of us. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is John Chapter 1, verse 14. We've talked about that verse many times, haven't we? God became flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. He was miraculously conceived, yet naturally delivered. He was born, yet born of a virgin. Had Jesus simply descended to the earth in the form of a mighty being, we would respect him, but we would never draw close to him. After all, how could God understand what it means to be human? Had Jesus been biologically conceived with two earthly parents, we would draw near to him, but we wouldn't worship him. After all, he really was then be no different than you and me. But if Jesus was both, God and man at the same time, then we have the best of both worlds. Neither his humanity nor his deity compromised. He was fully human and fully divine God. Because of the first, we draw near. Because of the latter, we can worship him. Such is the message of Colossians 1, verses 15 and 16. And we've often looked at these Jesus as God verses together, y'all. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Not one drop of divinity was lost in the change to humanity. Not Though Jesus appeared human, he was actually God. The fullness of God, every bit of him, took residence in the body of Christ. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. That's Colossians 1, 19 in the NASB uh, translation. The star maker for a time built cabinets in Nazareth. Jesus may have looked human, but to those nearest him, they knew he was prone to divine exclamations. So so often, ever so often, Jesus just let his divinity take over. The bystanders had no option but to step back and ask, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. That's Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Some years ago, I served as a teacher in a week-long Bible retreat. There was much to recall about the event. The food was phenomenal. The seaside setting was spectacular. I even made new friends. Yet, of all the memories, the one I will never forget is the Friday night basketball game. 
The idea was hatched. The idea was hatched the moment David arrived. The attendees did not know he was coming, but as soon as he walked on into the room, they all knew who it was. David Robinson, NBA All-Star, MVP, three-time Olympian, two-time gold medal winner, Dream Team member, two-time NBA champion, college All-Star American, seven, I'm sorry, college All-American, seven feet and one inch of raw talent, body rips, skills honed, basketball IQ, legendary. By the end of the first day, someone asked me, any chance he would play basketball with us? Us was a collection of pudgy, middle-aged, well-meaning, but out-of-shape fellows. Bodies, plump, skills, pathetic, by, uh, basketball IQ, slightly less than that of a squirrel. Still, I asked David, and David, in an utter display of indulgence, said yes. We scheduled the game, the game, for Friday night, the last night of the seminar. Attendance in the Bible classes declined. Attendance on the basketball court increased. Fellows who had, hadn't dribbled a ball since middle school could be seen heaving shot after shot at the basket. The net was seldom threatened. The night of the game, the game, the game, David walked onto the court for the first time all week. As he warmed up, the rest of us stopped. The ball fit in his hand like a tennis ball would in mine. He carried a conversation while he dribbled the ball, spinning the ball on his finger and passing the ball back and forth behind his back. When the game began, it was David and children. He held back, we could tell. Even so, he took one stride for our two. He caught the ball with one hand instead of two. When he threw the ball, it was more like a missile than a pass. He played basketball at a level we could only dream about. But at one point, just for the fun of it, I suppose he let loose. Are y'all seeing the analogy here? And it's just an analogy. So please uh, don't think that anybody's comparing a human being to Jesus Christ. But Matt Lucado, as an author, is making this incredible analogy. Now, this is going to be going into a second um, video. So this will definitely be parts. And I hope you'll stay with me in this 